Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take a couple of data points. We use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor with you in Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor, is with us in New York. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. Okay, so in the second half of the show, we're going to be talking about the United States and various changes in the economic and political situation there. But first, another topic, one that's not unrelated to the United States. The data point there is 32 billion. That was the value in US dollars estimated earlier this year of the cryptocurrency exchange FTX. The current value of FTX is now a matter for courts to figure out. That's ever since it declared bankruptcy on November 11th. The ripple effect from crypto exchange FTX's bankruptcy filing is growing. The company had been one of the largest in these United States. It went from flourishing to bankrupt in about a week's time. And now the company is also facing possible criminal investigation. At its height, the exchange had 1 million users. It sponsored sports stadiums, bought Super Bowl commercials. Its founder, Sam Bankman Freed, became not just a symbol of economic success, but a political player, even something of a cultural icon with his shambolic appearance and commitment to philanthropic causes. Basically, FDX was a symbol of the cryptocurrency boom of recent years, and I guess that raises the question of whether its fall is a symbol too. So, Adam, to me, it seemed like FDX represented like the boring side of crypto, presented itself as an exchange where people could buy cryptocurrency and then store that cryptocurrency. You know, it sort of sounds like something as banal as a bank, basically. So how could something so banal implode in such dramatic fashion? Oh, that's so interesting you put it like that. I mean, because a bank bank may be banal, but um, an unregulated bank is an extremely dangerous thing. And that's mm. essentially what it amounted to, right? It was a place where people had accounts. And in this particular case, the exchange was, was harnessed to a trading outfit and the trading outfit ran into a liquidity problem, basically when a, I think a crypto hedge fund, Three Arrows Capital, collapsed in June and that then triggered a wave of you know, anxiety really about the financing of, of trading. And, and then you know, when, when people peeled away the plaster, as it were, you discovered that there was really nothing there. And then these were both the, the exchange and the trading arm of FTX were, I mean, catastrophically uh, badly managed by any conventional standard, and their balance sheets were uh, uh, just a complete joke. I mean, if you look at the FTX uh, exchange, they apparently had about $900 million of easily saleable assets against about $9 billion of liabilities. But these that's a sort of one to ten, you know, one to ten kind of a ratio, which is not altogether untypical of banks, except that this wasn't a bank in any technical sense of the word. It wasn't regulated as such. It had no backstop. And of the 900 million in easily saleable assets, half were what looked like Bankman Freed's kind of personal Robin Hood share account, um, 470 million of it in about 134 corporate entities. So this isn't, you know, cash in the way that you would normally want to have in a banking outfit of this type. The whole thing was was incredibly fragile. And when you get into the FTX trading arm, it just becomes completely crazy. I mean, we're still trying to figure out in the just sort of ragged collection of Excel spreadsheets, which have emerged as, you know, what purport to be FTX trading's balance sheets, what exactly is going on. But the essence of it seems to be that a huge amount of their, um, in large, to a large extent, borrowed funds went into either very high risk venture projects, which you would normally not engage in heavy leverage for because the risk is so high. And on the other hand, very large holdings of tokens and various other tokens and things related to tokens that were all in fact issued by FTX in various ways. So essentially the company was holding its own stuff with borrowed money. And it's not obvious that the people in charge really fully understand quite how grievous the charges against them might conceivably be. They shuffled money around between the exchange side of the business and the trading side of the business as though this was no big deal. 
Hmm. Whereas, in fact, there should clearly have been just a, an absolutely, you know, solid firewall between the two businesses. Um, and in any other branch of finance, this would be considered an absolutely egregious violation of basic codes of conduct. OK, so this raises the question of where were the regulators? Sam Bankman Fried famously donated a lot of money to Democrats, millions of dollars, even tens of millions. Do you think that was influencing how regulators in Washington were monitoring FTX? I really don't know. And I think one shouldn't, you know, on the one hand, it's clearly true that we speculate about these kinds of things all the time. And people of my kind of political persuasion are not slow to make assumptions of that type, for instance, about the kind of influence that is bought by conservative business people when they give money to the Republican Party. There must clearly be some kind of quid pro quo. And I'm not going to like, you know, rule that out as a potential possibility. And again, there will be a job for muckraking journalism in trying to figure out whether that's gone on. And there's no reason prima facie to doubt that the Democratic Party could be swayed in that way and that business attempts to influence them. But if you're actually talking about the relevant regulators here, do I believe that, you know, Gary Gensler at the SEC was bought in this way? No, I don't at all. That doesn't seem remotely plausible to me. I don't think they took it very seriously. Um, and I think basically they wanted to kill it and they would ideally have liked to be able to ban it. And But banning it would have been hugely unpopular. Look, after all, Tom Brady was on television advertising this stuff. Or I don't quite remember. Did he really do FTX or was it just crypto in general? But anyway, you know, there was a huge celebrity buy into this thing. So outright banning would make you look out of touch, po-faced or whatever. So if, if you want this to stop, and you don't want to ban it, what is the best way to go? It is definitely not to extend the protection, the privilege, if you like, of serious regulation to this system. Because as all the survivors of the crypto business right now are, are you know, advocating on sort of crypto gullible platforms like Bloomberg, like they desperately want regulation now because it'll make them look more respectable. No, if you want to kill this thing, you let it burn. Um, you know, you let it die of natural causes, which is exactly what's happened. I mean, and you can do that so long as it remains modestly small, right? You, you know, our starting number around about $30 billion. That's a painful hit, but it's not going to bring the system down. So I think that's probably the stance of the regulators. They didn't regulate it because they didn't think it was necessary to in the short run because it wasn't systemic, because it was quite complicated, because it was politically sensitive, yes, but also, I think, in their batter their minds, because they thought basically, look, if you know, this thing will probably just explode of its own accord. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Should we be expecting any wider financial contagion out of this? I mean, if not, why not? It's simply because it's not big enough. And mm. the numbers are inflated because they record, as it were, the internal valuations of this stuff. Whereas the real question needs to be how much money real money actually went in and whether those losses are in weak hands, which were themselves leveraged, which would then, you know, create a problem. So just imagine, imagine, think of, think of the crypto game, the inside crypto game as like a monopoly game. And, you know, you play monopoly a long, long session. We all know how invested you can get in your houses and your hotels and your pile of cash. But at the end of the monopoly game, there comes this sad moment where you pack up the board and put all your mm. money back in and, all of those beautiful hotels that you built, they just go away, right? And that's essentially what's happening in much of this crypto write-down. It's just, we've decided to end the game. The only ramification this has is if this is a monopoly game where to get a seat at the table, you have to put down real cash. Now, a lot of the time in these crypto games, you actually put down other crypto tokens. So that's as though there's like a cascading hierarchy of monopoly games in which you buy your seat at the next table by cashing in the hotels you had in the previous monopoly game. But the ultimate question is, how much did you put in in terms of real cash at the very beginning of this cascade to get into the game? Now, that's the real loss that people suffer as a result of this, of these monopoly boards being folding up, right? And that's painful to the people that suffer that loss. It only generates a real financial crisis if they are themselves what is called weak hands. In other words, if that's not just their life savings or the money they put aside for their kids' education, which is a huge loss to their family but doesn't cause a catastrophe, it's a real problem if they had borrowed that money from a bank. Because at the moment when you've borrowed the money from the bank to join the monopoly game, when the monopoly game folds and you can't pay the bank back, the bank has a problem. Now, insofar as you've only borrowed a couple of hundred thousand dollars from the bank, it's your problem. 
But if you had borrowed hundreds of billions of dollars from a bank to join the monopoly game, which is kind of literally what happened here, and the monopoly game sounds trivial, but the money in these systems is no more real than monopoly money is, unless you have borrowed those sorts of system-threatening quantities of money, there is no real damage. There are a series of individual tragedies where people have literally staked their life savings or you know anything else on on this ga- on this gamble, but it doesn't produce a systemic crisis. It doesn't produce a systemic risk. So I guess just to finish off, we've talked about crypto before, and I guess this gets me wondering, will cryptocurrencies ever come back? I mean, if this represents, in fact, the kind of crash of the cryptocurrency fad, should we be expecting it to come back? Is this maybe like the kind of pets.com bust in the late 90s that preceded a longer lasting rally of internet companies? Is there some fundamental sense in which the world needs crypto? Well, I mean, crypto loyalists, in you know, fairness to them, will tell you that what went bust here is an exchange, not a not a, a coin, not a token. And you can, of course, still hold on to your Bitcoin. They're still useless as a means of payment, as they have always been. They're still meaningless as a unit of account. Those are two major functions of money. And as a store of value, which is maybe the third, they've depreciated by 75% since the peak uh, exactly a year ago in November 2021. And all of that has happened in a period of inflation, which is precisely what crypto was supposed to protect you against. And if you had just held nasty old fiat money, like tatty old greenback currency, you would have suffered about an 8% loss as a result of inflation over the last 12 months. And if you kept it in Bitcoin, you would have suffered a 75% loss. So if that's your game and you like that gamble, then it's still there for you and Bitcoin has not gone away. And if you join the monopoly game, to continue that analogy, early enough, you are still sitting on really large monopoly board gains, right? So you, you, you bought, the, um, you bought the, your monopoly chips you know, three, four, five, six, seven years ago. And Bitcoin is still double relative to November 2019. So your money, if you were willing to cash out right now, you could cash out right now and walk away with actual real money winnings if you wanted to. And those in that game will be in and out and thinking about it. And that, to me, is the continued function of Bitcoin. It's a form of gambling. It's a form of, you know, a get rich quick scheme in which you bet on other people's get rich quick schemes. And that's its value. And that, you know, amongst consenting adults, why not? It's a form of entertainment. There's all sorts of other worse things that people could be doing with their lives. Um, If they want to follow this story, they can follow this story. It's like a league or any other one of these sorts of social conventions. Um, you could say it's a morbid symptom of a you know society obsessed with wealth and the next big thing. Um, but you know, there's no reason to be judgmental, judgmental about it. That's just you know the game that it is. The real cost, and this is an absolutely fundamental concern, um, is of course the mining of the tokens, especially insofar as they follow the classic Bitcoin protocol of proof of work. They are a ruinous and absolutely absurd use mm. of fossil fuel, and for that reason, they should be banned. But it isn't the activity itself that requires, I think, any intervention of that type. So so long as it remains within a a reasonable scale of the kind of kind that we've seen, it's it's essentially just that, a form of beauty contest, as Keynes would have said, gambling, where you gamble on what everyone else thinks is going to be the next quick, you know, get rich quick scheme. And that's what you do. So perhaps the odds are better than, you know, doing well in a lottery. We've spoken about the, the you know, the odds of, of lottery and the sort of sociology of those. There's no reason to be particularly morally exercised about it because it's clearly symptomatic of wider stresses in society. Um, if it got big, it, it would pose potentially systemic risks, especially if people are leveraging, if they're borrowing to play the game and if they're borrowing within the real credit system, not the not the Bitcoin credit system itself. To the extent it remains on the monopoly board and in the chain of monopoly boards, it's to a large extent just simply a particularly complicated form of gambling. And to the extent that it spins off, you know, political rhetorics about how it's going to change the financial system mm-hmm. and so on, I think it's confusing because it isn't. Yeah, I appreciate your non-judgmental tone here. I, I mean, if it were up to me, I think FTX should get you for the next Super Bowl commercial. It, it might not be as 
you know, not might be as attractive as Tom Brady, but I think it would be more objective. You know, well, it's but what's really funny is that you know sports gambling was legalized at the same time as they started using hmm. all of these icons of sport, and so back to back on you know in, in the intermission of American football games which is where I was, watch most of my you know, TV commercials in the US, like, you would literally have back-to-back -back hmm. rappers advertising and, and uh, advertising various types of sports gambling and, and then, you know, Damon and, and Brady advertising crypto. Um, yeah, but the gambling wouldn't be on the surface of the crypto commercials, right? It would, it would be. Uh, oh no, 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 no! no it was all, you know, yeah. you know, the only those of, who venture yeah. ever gain, and like, no, absolutely, it was all this big futuristic. So to that extent, I much prefer the, you know, the just the hedonistic, um, you know, uh, gambling ads because they, they, I think they're franker about and 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 frankly, you know, making educated guesses and bets on on sophisticated sports may may be a you know, may, may be an inherently more valuable intellectual activity than trying to guess and outsmart whatever crazy narrative is running through the crypto world right now. Because in the end, somebody does very skillfully and, you know, credit where credit is due. He is the goat. Like, you know, skillfully manipulate a ball and a complex group of men down a field. That's a real Mm. A real talent, <laughs> you know. That's a real thing. If Brady was a, if Brady was a currency, it wouldn't, you know, it would be a different story than. than well, uh, unfortunately, he's... he takes his talent and translates it to something which is inherently worthless. Well, he's getting old too. But uh, <laughs> um, I will say we've been consistent on cryptocurrency. I think this is the third or fourth time we're talking about it, and that, and and our, I, you know, this podcast line has not changed. It's you know, we've always sort of been very. This it, this is the about thing. It's deciding. never been a hard thing to call this. Like, mm. This is like, I'm sorry, you know, I'm not, as you know, like somebody who normally like points at the fundamentals and says, oh, we know it's really simple. This is the story. But mm. you look at this and I just, you have to say, like, it's yep. a really remarkable demonstration of the ability of hyped narratives. And they're big historic narratives, right? You know, all the way back to Vasco da Gama and stuff like Damon's ads were particularly high octane ideological um uh cases really um you know that, that it's 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 mm. it's it's that's what it is it's a it's a kind of a remarkable demonstration of the collective capacity to you know get in on those kind of narratives yeah and people have short memories obviously as well <laughs> they can't reach for those analogies not even you know analogies from a few years ago it seems well okay we do need to leave it here we will be back in a second to talk about the United States. Hi, welcome back. So the next data point is 7.7%. That was the rate of inflation in the United States in October, which was down from the 8.2% in September. Some people are taking that as an indication that inflation is finally slowing in at least in the United States. The release of that data point actually came late last week, just a couple days after the midterm elections in the United States, in which the expected red wave that would sweep Republicans to power did not come to pass. Democrats will maintain control of the Senate. Republicans have now secured a majority in the House of Representatives. With a very slim margin that is really historically uh, quite significant. So these two new developments, a potential slowdown in inflation and a new constellation in Washington, seem to be the abiding political and economic facts in the United States these days. So, yeah, we thought we'd discuss. Yeah, Adam, it seems safe to say that inflation did not play a kind of dispositive role in the midterm elections, contrary to what many observers expected. Have we learned anything from the elections about the politics of inflation? I mean, I'd love to just simply agree with you here. But um, I mean, I, you know, in fairness, we should say that an inflation hawk is always going to say, well, fair enough. Yes, there wasn't the huge red you know, tsunami, but perhaps if there hadn't been the inflation at almost 8 percent, the Democrats might have retained their majority in the House. You know, mm. we just can't know that one way or the other. And, and it, it will take it will take some fairly sophisticated number crunching to even frame that kind of counterfactual modeling i mean i don't rule it out as a as a possibility you basically have to construct models of voters you know and the strength of their inflation preferences and then run a counterfactual in which inflation somehow was only five percent or something and see what that would do 
what we do know, as you say, is it wasn't dispositive in the sense that we clearly aren't in a situation where voters looked at the inflation rate of almost 8% and said, I just simply can't vote for these Democrats. Like, they're done. You know, they've blown it. It's all over. And, and I have to say, I think that is a reasonable interpretation of what the hawkish position on inflation was. I actually think folks like Larry Summers, you know, believe that pretty much. And, you know, my friend Robert Armstrong at the FT said as much, you know, and was honest enough to say it. Like I just, he said, and Robert said, you know, I just didn't think an American president could get a, uh, could could achieve this kind of an election outcome with 8% inflation. And lo and behold, they did. So what we've clearly learned is that people don't like inflation. I think that's obvious. And perhaps, you know, inflation doves of my type underestimated the extent to which people don't like inflation. But clearly, they also balance it against other issues. And if you have a shock like Roe versus Wade repeal and a bunch of really bad candidates backed by a rogue ex-president, then the Democratic base and a bunch of new young voters will rally enough to give you an above average midterm result. And I think that's what we've that's what we've learned. As I said, inflation does seem now to be slowing down in the United States. So I, I guess I was wondering, should we revisit the debate about whether inflation is transitory? This has come up before. You were firmly in team transitory before, suggesting that inflation was going to be a temporary issue. Yeah, where do you stand on the transitory question these days? I'm still, you know, up there defending Fort Transitory on our hill. Like, uh, <laughs> you, you know, know I think getting, suffered, you were lonely there for a while. We're, we're, I suffered a wound or two, not feeling, <laughs> but not feeling completely Monty Python esque, you know, not Black Knight. Uh, um, but actually, actually figuring I, we're not actually going to have to die on this hill. I mean, I feel that's, you know, where I'm at right now. I think we're winning. Um, you know, our opponents will say that's not fair, right? What we thought we were arguing about was a spike of a few months. And instead, we're talking 12 months on and inflation is just inching down. But then, of course, Team Transitory would invoke Putin and his war and how that blew up everyone's calculus. But I mean, to see the major indices inching down the way that we currently see them doing in the US is pretty much exactly what I would have thought was going to happen, to be honest. I mean, and goods inflation is now in disinflationary territory. So if you break out the bit, which is to do with things people buy in shops, like that, those are all going down, uh, have been now for a while. Wages never caught up. There's never been a wage price spiral. Inflation expectations did move slightly and in the wrong direction. But if you look at the big markets, they're all still basically predicting a path which in the broader scheme of things, I would describe as transitory. And perhaps people on the other side of this argument would say, well, no, it was like a sustained burst of high inflation or something. So we would be this would be a semantic argument. If you dig into the inflation numbers now, the only big driver of inflation in the US, the one that's really a big dynamic factor is shelter. So that's housing, and that's made up of a bunch of complicated components, including hotel costs, which have surged for reasons which are a little obscure. But the thing that's going to carry the, you know, the inflation story forward is basically rents, which because of the way in which they're calculated in the cost of living index, slowly adjust in a lagged way. But if you look at the rest of the housing sector, we already know it's tipped, right? I mean, the American real estate sector and housing is in fact now in a fairly precipitous decline which is not surprising after all, because we've doubled mortgage interest rates in barely more than half a year. And so it's, you know, it would be frankly mind boggling if the housing market did not respond to that by slowing down dramatically. So yeah, I'm, I'm you know, confidently expecting prices, price increases to continue to slow. If you go hard on inflation, it means sticking up interest rates. Those That mortgage rate increase is going to squeeze a lot of families there's going to be distress here and an increase in unemployment. So the reason why this debate matters is not just it's no, it's not just some sort of, you know, ego driven contest between wonks. This is really a battle over what the priorities of economic policy should be and whether we should really regard. And this is team transitory talking now, you know, record low levels of unemployment and the labor market remarkably hot and dragging people out of precarious situations into work, whether we should regard that as a problem or not. And um, and that's, you know, th those are the stakes and they're intensely serious. There are some indications that the Federal Reserve might delay further interest rate hikes in the immediate future as a result of this new inflation data. I'm just curious whether that decision might also be informed by the 
precarious international economic situation. You've written about, you know, how there are signs of a global recession and how that could blow back on the United States. And yeah, is that something that the Fed might be taking into account when it's thinking about interest rates? I mean, they're super smart people. They have an incredibly good team of economists monitoring the whole world. They will be cognizant of this for sure. One of the things that has turned is that um, the dollar is, you know, has gone through a series of weeks now of, of much greater weakness. The, the double pressure of the rising dollar and rising American interest rates was exerting a really painful squeeze on much of the world. There was also a surge in commodity prices. Food prices have now stopped increasing and are really, really turning quite hard. So that pressure is easing. But I don't think one should be any, under any illusions. I mean, the Fed monitors the entire world economy and tracks blowback and is just generally interested in how the world economy develops. But in making their policy decisions, it's all about the United States. And it, and it has to be. That's their mandate. That's what they're politically legitimized to do. Only in extreme situations where you have really big partners of the United States in real distress would you expect much deviation from that norm and that rule. That is part of the tension built into a global system in which America's national currency functions as the global currency. And they will be watching the American news. And, and I think at the core of that is the housing market, because obviously we've seen a huge sell off in equities. The, finance, the stock market has taken a, a huge hit. Big tech companies above all have been savaged. But what really matters in a much greater degree to average Americans is the housing market, real estate. And I think that's the variable they're going to be watching. So to shift to politics, Republicans will control the House of Representatives. I'm curious whether that on its own poses any economic risks that we should be taking into account. Yeah, I mean the the obvious one is on the budget side. So you could get a you could get a standoff over the debt ceiling. We've had that before, driven by the House before, uh, two times in fact during the Obama administration, 2011 and 2013. There is still that wing of the GOP, which is not just in the business of starving the beast, as they like to say, but of um, smashing the administrative state, as Bannon once announced um, in a moment of bravado. Or just, you know, they're aiming to just embarrass the Biden administration. I mean, it's, it's you know, worth thinking back to those moments. I mean, when Xi Jinping announced the One Belt, One Road program at an Asian summit, Obama wasn't there because the federal government was in lockdown in the United States because because they'd hit the debt ceiling. I mean, you know, this this stuff really matters to American global leadership. And of course, it matters to huge numbers of federal employees who will be impacted by these kind of shenanigans. It will paralyze government. The question, of course, is whether with the kind of narrow majority that the Republicans will have, whether they'll actually be able to muster the discipline within the caucus to inflict that kind of damage on American society, the American economy, and on America's global standing. There are cynical you know, observers of, of, of American politics and its impact on the economy who favor this kind of divided power. And in the abstract, you can kind of see why business might like this because, you know, on balance, they kind of quite like the status quo in America. And so a paralyzed Congress means basically nothing changes. Hmm. Um, but that, of course, assumes that that the Republican Party is a normal operator of the American political system. And, and that, I think, remains very much open to question. So finally, I wanted to ask about where Joe Biden stands and whether he deserves credit for figuring out a kind of new model for dealing with the intersection of politics and economics. By all accounts, he's gotten ambitious economic legislation through Congress in his first two years on climate spending, infrastructure, semiconductor investment, and the pandemic stimulus at the very beginning of, of the term. And yet, remarkably, there was little political blowback or at least public protest at, at all this legislation. Are there any lessons that could be drawn here about Bidenism as an approach to political economy? Yeah, I mean, I, full disclosure here, I was one of the people that wrote a, you know, a Biden administration obituary this summer. And so it's come as a surprise to me. And, and um the extent of the legislation they've been able to pass. I think I would still quibble, though, with the idea that this is the triumph of an ambitious agenda, and certainly one closely associated with the president himself. I think there was a team of progressive folks, economists, some of them associated with the Sanders campaign, who early in the administration were pushing a very ambitious agenda, right? It had three prongs. 
Um, it was the, the the immediate response to COVID that was so overdue, the infrastructure program, and then the which climate was rolled into, and then the families plan, which was going to rebuild the American welfare state around the needs of American families. And very little of that has actually made it through. They did the stimulus. They were able to rally the party and the majority to do that. And then after that, it's been this protracted, agonizing struggle to pass what in the end is, I mean, whether judged by the initial ambitions of the administration or by the needs of the moment, if you like, I mean, hard to describe as an ambitious program. And then finally, the whole thing is wrapped, especially when you look at CHIPS and in, to a degree also Inflation Reduction Act in a kind of national protectionism, which is directed against China. So that's the vector that's emerged, if you like, as the product of these contending forces. And that's, you know, all legislation in America is complex. It's very rare for a presidential agenda to be you know, fully realized that hasn't happened here and something else has emerged. And to that extent, they have definitely demonstrated the capacity to act and to get legislation passed. But it is it is exactly that, no more, no less, right? This this sort of nationalist, protectionist, it's very pro-business, it's all carrots, no sticks. Mm. And in the end, you know, one looks at it and thinks, is it all that surprising that you can pass multi-10 billion dollar packages, which are basically taxpayer-funded giveaways to big American business? Hmm. whilst stripping away the progressive rhetoric, cladding it in anti-Chinese rhetoric and inserting it into an, in, you know, a deficit reduction bill. I'm not sure I'm surprised. I mean, in the sense you could say, well, if, you know, if that was on the table and that was the only thing that was on the table, how, why did it take so agonizingly yeah. long to get there? <laughs> you know, all carrots and no sticks may be the way to sum it up. But yeah, it sounds so obvious, but no one's tried it before. It seems like, why, you know, yeah. it's like, uh, uh, yeah, at yeah. that level, yeah, absolutely. Why not? It was an open door, they went through it. Yeah, okay, so we do need to leave it there for now. Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It is produced by Laura Rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tady. The executive editor of FP Podcasts is Dan Efron. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested not just in Adam Tews, but news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Ones and Twos listeners even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code Tews at checkout. That is T-O-O-Z-E. And listeners, as always, we love hearing your feedback. You can send us voice messages on the Ones and Twos homepage on foreignpolicy.com, or you can email us, podcasts at foreignpolicy.com, or tweet us. That's at Ones and Twos Pod. Thanks very much for listening, and we will see you back in your feed next week. <laughs>